end, which is taken from 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 14. So I thought let's um, look at verse 11 to 14 and see the richness of Scripture and the meaning to understand the depth of this greeting at the end of our worship services. So let's read together from verse 11. It's then the closing of the letter. Finally, brothers, rejoice, aim for restoration, comfort one another, agree with one another, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. As I open up this text to us this evening, you'll see the title of the sermon, Six Corporate Responsibilities of a Local Church. You'll notice that this greeting is a final greeting coming at the end of the letter to the second Corinth, uh, this, as the second letter to the Corinthians. And Paul now, in the, as the second letter that he wrote to the Corinthian church, calls them to the gospel truths which they know but they are neglecting. You'll know that the specific problem in the Corinthian church is their own uh, conflated idea of what spirituality means. And so they sometimes view themselves uh, individually as more spiritual than their brothers and sisters. There were fights in the previous letter Paul mentions. They were arguing over, I'm of Paul, I'm of Cephas, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Christ. And you also note in the first letter that Paul talks about coming to them and hoping to find them repentant of many of these things. But the second letter that he writes to the Corinthian church, we find that the things that he addressed in the first letter have not got any better, but in fact they have worsened. And Paul needs to speak more urgently to them, more with a tone of urgency and worry but with a tone of compassion towards them. You'll just look at chapter 10. If you just page there quickly at chapter 10. He says, I, Paul, myself, entreat you by the meekness and the gentleness of Christ. I who am humble when face to face with you, but bold toward you when I am away. I beg of you that when I am present, I may not have to show boldness with confidence as I count on showing against some who suspect us of walking according to the flesh. You can see some of the issues in the Corinthian church have spiraled into something unwanted, unpleasant. But Paul still loves the Corinthian church as an apostle of Christ. And as someone who knows, you'll remember from the book of Acts, that Paul was told by God himself, I have many people in this place. And Paul stayed in Corinth and ministered amongst the people. And then this church came about. And this church has many problems. And many people would have probably written off this church as, Oh, why not just close the doors and start all over? I see some of you smiling at that because maybe that's the view even of Emmaus Baptist Church sometimes, right? I know because I've spoken to many people who know the history of our congregation. There are many folks who have thought, maybe this church should have closed its doors years ago because of all the problems and the issues. But you see, people tend to look at things, and we tend to look at things from an administrative perspective. Doesn't look good on the books. Doesn't look good on the finances. Doesn't look good on the this and the that. But whatever measure we use to measure a church's health, this is not the measure of Scripture, you see. You see, though the church in Corinth had many problems, it was still the church of Christ in Corinth. Though they are limping along in many senses, they are still the church of Jesus Christ in that place. Are we, the Mayest Baptist Church, still, still a church of Christ here in this place? I believe so. I believe so. I hope you are thoroughly convinced of this as well. But for us to be a church in fellowship with the triune God, a local church in fellowship with Christ under His headship, favored by God and in fellowship with the Holy Spirit, 
We must also know that we are called to certain responsibilities. And even the church in Corinth is called to these various responsibilities. So though he's spoken in such a way in chapter 10, when Paul writes, now at the end he tells the brothers, finally brothers, rejoice. Boy, he's just threatened us to come and speak harshly to us. Now he's telling us rejoice. The same man who was bold toward them in certain cases, confronting them with certain of the sins and certain of the thinking of the people in the church, is now the one greeting them all and saying, Finally, brothers, rejoice. This is a greeting to the whole church. Finally, brothers, rejoice. You'll see these responsibilities. They are imperatives in the you plural. You all rejoice. Finally, brothers, you all rejoice. It's an instruction. It's an imperative. The word rejoice here is not just to say, don't worry, be happy. It's not just don't worry, be happy. What he's saying with the word rejoice, it's linked to the word from which we get grace. Rejoice because of the grace you have received. Properly, it means to delight in the grace that God has given us. To experience God's grace and favor. To be conscious then of His goodness toward us. Where is the source then of this happiness and rejoicing and joy? You see? This is our joy. Not that we have everything sorted out on the box. Not that we look good to a world outside. But that we rejoice because we know that we've received grace and favor from God. We are God's favored ones and beloved ones, aren't we? Aren't we? So rejoice in that. Rejoice. Let this be your joy. Let this be your comfort. God is at work in your midst. He is the one who is building His church. He is the one who is addressing the sins in the church. He is the one to sort out all of the problems. You see, this is the confidence of even Paul the Apostle. But he also knows that he's been called to bring these things to light through the preaching and through the writing of the letters and to speaking the gospel to the church at all times. I want you to see the connection here between the faith and the words of Jesus Christ and the power of the word of Christ that we looked at this morning. If our confidence is in the power of Christ's word to heal a son, right, like he did for the nobleman this morning, do we as a church corporately have faith that the word of Christ will fix the problems that we have? Or do we continually need to think, I just need to fix this problem so that we can continue listening to the word of Christ? You see, if we have that kind of view, we tend to think we can say to Christ, I have no time to listen to you. I have things to sort out and then I'll come to listen to you whenever I have time. You see? You see, that doesn't reflect faith and confidence that Christ is the one who builds his church, that doesn't reflect faith and confidence that Christ is the one who leads us through all trials and difficulties. We don't believe then in the divine power of God's word to sort out these things, do we? If that's our outlook. But if we continually devote ourselves to God's word, to listening to him, to being obedient, to rejoice in the grace that is sufficient for this day. I mean, we've sung it twice now. We've read it in the psalm. God is with us every day. His mercy is new every day. And just notice, when I speak about these six corporate responsibilities with each one, I want to remind us again, we have this responsibility because we are in fellowship. We are in fellowship with the triune God. Rejoice because it's God's grace that is shining upon you. God is gracious to us, therefore we have the responsibility to respond. Not with saggy so shoulders and oh. I'm so favored by God. What a burden. 
How can you react? It doesn't make sense. So can you also see when Jesus says, take my yoke upon you, my burden is light. It really is light, isn't it? Rejoice. You have every reason to rejoice. You have every reason to be glad, exceedingly glad. And if I explain it this way, you also will know that this is not the kind of flippant happiness. Smile and wave, everything's going to be okay. There's a deep and meaningful joy. It's a kind of peace and joy that's seated deep within us. Where we can be calm and at peace with God. The next responsibility, responsibility number two, is rendered in the ESV as aim for restoration. Aim for restoration. Another translation there is be perfected. Be perfected. This word is in the passive form, so this means that we're not actively pursuing this in a way, but we must allow this to come over us. So again, like the rejoicing which is part of the grace of God that comes to us and it's our natural response to God's fellowship and favor toward us, so also be perfected means don't resist this work of God in you. Again, it's a corporate responsibility. Be perfected. The dictionary explains the meaning of this word as to be properly adjusted. Allow yourself to be properly adjusted. It's passive, right? Allow yourself to be placed by God in the church, in the place where He calls you to. Listen to His Word, how He directs you. Men, women, brothers, children. And notice what God would have you in particular do in the church. And be ready be ready to fit properly and be adjusted by Him, finding your place in the church by the help of God and the Holy Spirit. You see, this is part of my... It's not really a frustration as a pastor, I understand this. But sometimes people come to me and say, I, I, I can't find my place in the church. How do I find my place? Where do I... And people would just want the pastor to quickly say, go and do that, go and do that. Because it would be easy for me to just spell it out for you. And sometimes people are frustrated with me, with me when I say, I'll pray with you to find your place. It's not my work to make the place for you. Your place is made by Christ and the Holy Spirit. I'll pray with you that you find the place. That you're sensitive to God's Word. To find that place which He has for you. Be perfected. Be adjusted, be adjustable to fit properly and exactly as He would have you fit in in this place. But just note, again, this is a corporate responsibility that we have as a local church. Not one of us can do this alone. So just because you don't find a place doesn't mean you withdraw now. All of a sudden this place doesn't need me. Can you see? That would be the opposite of doing what this text says. This text says, be perfected. Look for the place to fit through prayer and by the help of the Lord. The third responsibility that we have, comfort one another. It's also rendered be exhorted it's again in the same form as that word be perfected or aim for restoration it refers here to the believers offering up of evidence that stands up in the court of God exhorting means that we call one another to the standard of God's word not to the standard of my opinion what I like or what you like I want us to do this. What would you like us to do? See, that's not why we have church meetings. We're not meeting together to find out what the majority of the church wants to do. It's not a democracy in that sense. The only question that we have as a church is asked, will we follow the Lord or not? You see? 
Will we follow the Lord or not? And so we need to pray as a church together. Let us ask the Lord how He may direct us. And let us conform to His standard, you see. Again, it's our corporate responsibility. We're all in this together. And we're in this together because we are in fellowship with God. If we're in fellowship with God, His standards matter. Isn't this the whole lesson of the Old Testament? When He makes the tabernacle in the midst of the people of Israel teaches them, if I come and dwell in your midst as God, everything, everything revolves around God and not you. The whole life of the church revolves around God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The moment that we as a church think we can pull in a different direction than our Father, and the Son and the Holy Spirit, we are out of fellowship with God. And that's the most dangerous place for a local church to be. You see, that's not the place for God's favored and beloved one. If I can use an illustration here. I train my kids not to put themselves in the way of danger. I don't want them to put themselves in the way of danger. Will they sometimes put themselves in the way of danger? Will the local church sometimes put themselves in the way of danger? Okay. What is God going to do? Okay, it's fine. Go and put yourself in danger. I won't say anything. You see, if I were to allow my kids to put themselves in danger and not say anything, I would be a terrible father. Terrible father. God is not a terrible father. He is a good father. And though he may shout at the top of his voice, Stop! Careful! We as a church need to hear that. We need to hear the voice of our Father in love calling us, Stop! Think! I've taught you many times. Said it many times. You're not listening. I need to say it again. But there's no way in which I'm going to shut my mouth and not tell you. But you see, the word here, be exhorted, is a call to the church to be sensitive to the voice of God. Sensitive to the direction of God. That's what we must be as a local church. Ready to hear, ready to listen, ready to do. The fourth responsibility. Agree with one another, says the ESV. Another translation may render it, be of the same mind. Be of the same mind. Well, some of you will know that word mind from Colossians 3 already. Mind here does not mean the brain. Mind does not mean the intellect. Mind does not mean you have to sit with a, the, with a systematic theology textbook and agree on every point of doctrine in every way. Because the fellowship of the local church is not based upon our broad agreement with particular points of doctrine. Or my understanding of them or your understanding of them. But fellowship in the church is to be of the same mind To be in fellowship with God, you see. Compare our thoughts one to another. Yes, you might be more correct than I am. I might be more correct than you are at certain points and at certain places. But we're not here to follow the person who is most correct in our midst. Can you see? We're not here in competition to see who's most correct on every point of doctrine and let's follow that guy. It's not how the church functions. It's not how the church functions because God Himself tells us in Isaiah, my ways are higher than your ways, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. Let's stop comparing ourselves with one another. 
Compare yourself to God's way. You see? How will we measure up? And then we must all bow and say, I'm not more correct than God. Right? I must let this issue go. I must let this debate. I must leave because this is not honoring to the Lord. Be of the same mind here is not just about the intellect. This word for mind more closely relates to the diaphragm rather than the brain. Because it talks not just about our thinking capacity, our intellectual capacity, but our capacity to regulate ourselves. The diaphragm is there to regulate your inward parts, regulate your breath. Breathe in, breathe out. Regulate all of the inside. Sometimes we have the spiritual hiccups. Spiritual hiccups mean our diaphragm is moving in an irregular way. Hiccups are not natural. It's not the natural state. Hiccups are the unnatural state when our brain tells us, breathe in, but the diaphragm says, breathe out. And then all of a sudden, the diaphragm hits your lungs and it pushes that air out and you make that funny noise. Be of the same mind. Have the same diaphragm regulating the life of the church. We should have the personal opinions of Christ rule us. We have, should have Christ ruling in our midst, as Paul puts it in Colossians 3. As Christ rules, he uses that word rule to indicate let Christ be the one to make the decisions to act as an empire, umpire or a referee in your life. Let Him be the one to regulate everything. Can you see that to be of the same mind means to let Christ rule in the church? Let Him be the one to tell us, be still, wait, go, breathe. Do. It's Christ who rules the church. It's only, so can you see, it's only when we are in fellowship with God that we even can keep these responsibilities that we're called to. These are not responsibilities which God gives us and tells us, go and sort them out on your own there in a corner. But these are responsibilities given to us because we are in fellowship with Him. And to maintain that fellowship with Him. Do we love to be in fellowship with God? If the answer is yes, we love to be in fellowship with God, we will be diligent to keep these responsibilities. Can you also see that when we don't keep these responsibilities, what we are saying in essence is we don't appreciate the fellowship of God with us. Can you see that? The fifth responsibility, be at peace. Be at peace. Living in the condition of God's peace in His gift of, whole, uh, of wholeness, integrity of being. It's a very important idea, this, the integrity of being. Do you know that when you've acted in a way without integrity, when your conscience tells you don't do this thing and you do it, you're torn in two almost. You're, you're almost ripping yourself apart by guilt. I shouldn't have done that. Oh, but I couldn't help my... You see, you're torn in two. This is to be the opposite of being at peace. Be at peace means, though it be difficult to obey God, I don't want to rip myself to pieces by not obeying Him, by having my conscience tearing me into two like that. I want to be a person with integrity and wholeness. And we as the church want to be a church of integrity and wholeness. And this comes from God who gives us the gift of a conscience cleared of our guilt. 1 
1 Peter 3, when we baptize people, we call them. You appear before God, making your appeal before God for a clear conscience. At the Lord's table, we are reminded that if the blood of the old covenant sprinkles and cleanses the body on the outside and is effective for that, much more is the blood of Christ effective for cleaning our defiled consciences. Can you see that be at peace also means keep a clear conscience. Keep a clear conscience. Make sure and make every effort that you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. Because it's when you sin, it's when you fall, it's when you do these things that you're tearing yourself apart. Can you also see that part of God's salvation Yes, is rescuing from sins we've already committed. But such a great part of God's salvation when we mature as Christians is to keep us from doing that same sin that rendered us broken. Can you see that that's the bulk of the work of God's salvation for us as Christians? To keep us from those very things that would tear us apart if we do them. It's no less a work of God's salvation than rescuing us after we have sinned. God rescuing us before we even sin by warning us, don't do it, is just as much a work of His salvation as picking up the broken pieces afterwards. In certain cases, it's harder work. Ask any parent. That work of continued watching over the children Warning them, teaching them, training them. It's much harder work to do that. The sixth one, you'll find in verse 12. The sixth responsibility, here is the sixth imperative. Greet one another with a holy kiss. And just before you go out and kiss everyone after the service, hang on a moment. Greet one another is the imperative here. Greet one another. Okay? Let me illustrate the point here. Paul wants us to greet one another in a particular way. That's why he tells them, greet one another with a holy kiss. A kiss was a common greeting of intimacy. People who are intimately known to one another, not in the same way, not in a sexual way, but intimate in the brotherly and familial way. So what Paul is suggesting here is greet one another with a greeting that is appropriate to demonstrate your intimacy with one another. In other words, when you're at the coffee shop with a family member or a friend who, are, who is outside of the church and you see your brother or sister from the church come in, you say, excuse me, I need to go greet my brother or sister. And you greet them. Warm, friendly, intimately. You see, do you greet them in this way? Your brothers and sisters from church, are you happy to see one another? Do you have this kind of intimacy with one another? Or do you hide your face away? Your friends ask you, who's that? No, oh, wait, just sit. Did they go yet? Yes, they're gone. Who was that? No, that's just someone from my church. C can you see? Can you see the damage this does to the local church's responsibility to be in fellowship with God and the people of God? What message are you sending? How will you minister to your friends and your family members who you want to become a part of your church, but this is the way you treat people in your church? Oh, you should come to our church. Oh, that church where you hide your face away when you greet one another. I've seen you do it. You hypocrite. You pretend to love your church, but you don't. I see. I'm. You see, this is the kind of things that just confirm atheists in their atheism because they stumble over Christians who don't even understand the basic 101 of Christianity I 
You see, if we're avoiding one another, we are setting an example of what our church is like. If you join our church, we will duck and dive and avoid you like the plague. That's why Paul says, greet one another. Greet one another then in a way that reflects the deep and intimate bond you have. You have a deep and intimate bond based upon what? Your fellowship with the triune God. Can you see if you behave in such a way, you are denying your own fellowship, not just with your brothers and sisters in Christ, but with God Himself. If you say, the fellowship of the church is not enough for me, you're in other words saying, the fellowship of God is not what I want. You see, then this benediction at the end is meaningless. It's meaningless to you. Because when we say, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, may the triune God in His fullness, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, may, be he, may he be graciously inclined, inclined to you. May He give you favor. May, you give, may He give you His love. May He extend the right hand of fellowship to you. And He does that in order for you to keep these responsibilities. When you duck and dive, you're saying, in other words, no thanks. I don't want fellowship with God. I don't want fellowship with His church. I want to talk for a moment here about something that I've recognized in all of us. I even recognize this in myself. Our time and our day is a day in which individuals long for fellowship. We all long to have deep and meaningful relationships. We all yearn for such a relationship. We all want that. I want more. I want more than just watching a movie. I want more than just talking about sunshine and roses. I want more. I want deeper. And what do we conclude? What's the conclusion we come to? I want, I want, and when we realize, but I'm, I, I still have this craving and it's unfulfilled and I'm not getting it. What's our solution then? I'm not getting what I want, so I am going to. And whatever you fill the dots in with, it's problematic because I am going to. I'm going to solve this problem. I'm going to get a solution here. I'm going to look elsewhere. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to. I am going to. Can you see? You've resolved to solve the problem on your own. The question for us is, what do we do in a world devoid of deep and meaningful relationships? What do we do? Let me suggest to you that the first step here is be reconciled to God. Because if you're estranged from God, you will be estranged from all other creatures of God. You cannot have a meaningful relationship with any of God's creatures apart from being reconciled to the Creator. So if you have a problem in your relationships, there's probably an indication that you have a strained relationship with God. Maybe there are certain things you should already have been doing to open up this relationship with you and God. You have reconciliation in Christ. He's given us all things. He's extended this grace to us. But it often indicates that there is estrangement from God in some way. And even us as Christians, though we've been reconciled to God, there are certain instances in where we still need to be called to fellowship with God. And called into communion with God as regularly as we can. Because you see, it's difficult to maintain a relationship with someone who is far from God. It's difficult to maintain a relationship with someone who is far from God. That includes people who 
you have relationship with who is far from God. And also, when you are far from God, it's difficult to maintain a relationship with you. Don't fail to notice that as well. Don't just look at other people who are far from God and think, oh, it's difficult to maintain a relationship with them. Sometimes you have strained relationship with a lot of people because you are far from God. Evaluate which is the case. You see, because people abandoned or have this, who has this relationship that is far from God, are often in the habit of abandoning people or being abandoned by people. You see, if I don't have a good relationship with God, every relationship in my life, especially if I think I am God, especially if I think I need to get people closer to me in order to have meaningful relationships, you know, if the, if the heat is turned on, I can just abandon that relationship when it becomes uncomfortable. I'm not your friend anymore. Doesn't suit me. Doesn't fit. It was just a season in my life. Doesn't work out for me. What's the solution? You see, we all think the solution would be just fix all the broken people in the world. Oh Lord, won't you just fix everyone outside? All the broken people in the world? Then this problem will be solved. If you just fix everyone, I will have fellowship. If you just fix everyone else, I will be okay. But listen. Listen to the promise of God. Listen to the promises of God here. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. We have been created with a need for fellowship. We have a need for fellowship. We have a want. So can you see how God has placed this want, this need in us, that cannot be fulfilled by anything but Himself? can't have it fulfilled any other way. We've been created with a need for fellowship. The need itself is not sinful, but the way we fill the need can be sinful. The way we seek to fill that need can be sinful. Just know this. When God fills that need of fellowship and deep relationship with Him, it changes all other relationships. Because friendship with God means enmity with the world. Just as friendship with the world means enmity with God. You cannot have a restored, reconciled relationship with God if you are holding on to worldly friendships, worldly relationships. The illustration of the coffee shop. If you are more on the side of your family members or worldly people or friends from the world than you are in unity with the body of Christ, with the local church, are you really a friend of God or an enemy of God? You see, the fellowship of the saints, the fellowship of the saints, when we say, I believe in the fellowship of the saints, of the holy ones, what we are saying is we are unified under the rule of Christ through fellowship with the Holy Spirit. We're unified to Christ under His rule through the fellowship with the Holy Spirit. God brings us together then for His purposes. For His purposes. If we forsake God's purposes then, then we will be scattered. We won't have this unity. We won't have this fellowship. We won't have these deep relationships. It will all be superficial. It will all be meaningless. So, dear brother and sister, you want to preserve Christian unity? Do you want to preserve Christian unity? If you want to preserve Christian unity, devote yourself completely to God. There is no Christian, Christian unity 
when we become godless. When God is missing from the mix, when we are not in fellowship with Him, it's a godless and worthless exercise. We might as well just cultivate worldly friendships. Don't let the local church just become another social club. Don't let the local church just become another social club. We're not here for the nice coffee. We're not here for the nice comfy chairs. We're not here for the wonderful sound system. It's not what we're here for. We're here because our soul longs to be filled with communion and fellowship with God. The church does not need more Christians who want to take hands and sing Kumbaya as a chant of Christian unity. The church needs more Christians who have fellowship with the Holy Spirit through faith. Can you see also here your own individual responsibility to keep the unity by keeping fellowship with God through the Holy Spirit? Christians who refuse to be enslaved to the world, who resolve to come under the ministry of Christ through personal devotion, through preaching, through devoting themselves to every means to obtain and lay hold of the fullness of salvation in Christ. Christian unity then and fellowship is the work of the Holy Spirit and not a work of the flesh. It's not our own work. It's a work of the Holy Spirit. So you see, I desire fellowship. You want fellowship. The solution is not to think about all the others who have problems. I mean, we all have a desire for our brothers and sisters to be better brothers and sisters to us. But you see, if you have that desire for others to be better brothers and sisters to you, how do you fix that? Become a better, better brother or sister to them. It's the only way. So, just for a moment here, you go to God in prayer. Lord, I want fellowship. Lord, I so yearn for fellowship. Just help my brothers to be better brothers and sisters. God answers. What does He say to you? According to this text, you have the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. You have the whole triune God in your corner. And God says to you, am I not enough for you? Is it not enough for you to be in fellowship with the triune God? To be in communion with Him? To be reconciled to Him? Then we answer with this trembling voice, right? Because how embarrassing. Yes, Lord. You should be and you are enough for us. And then what does God say to us? Stop crying and whining about others not giving themselves in fellowship to you. You have fellowship with me, God tells us, so that you may give fellowship to others. You're not called to get and get and get all the time. You're called to give. You're called to give of yourself in fellowship. You're called to take on these responsibilities of the local church. Because they are God-given responsibilities to you and to me. You see, then and only then will our fellowship, the supply of our fellowship, will then not be in the flesh, but in the power of the Holy Spirit. If more of us just hear from God, give. I have given to you, therefore go and give. Why we pray these things? May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, may God grant you all of these things so that you may take the things granted by God and accomplish these responsibilities that He's laid upon you. God is enough for me. I'm full to the brim with all the fellowship I need and could want. 
And even more so, because God does not withhold from me or from you or from us. He gives us so much more so that we can share His fellowship with others. Some of us are running on empty because we love the friendship of the world more than we love fellowship with God and His people. That's why we run on empty. I pray that in this year to come we would all want to fill ourselves with this. May the Lord fill us with His grace. And this will be our prayer at the end of this worship service. May the grace of Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us. I also understand that when we turn to the Lord's table, God in a visible way demonstrates for us that the grace of Christ is with us, that the love of the Father is with us, and that the fellowship of the Holy Spirit is with us. For the Lord's Supper is our fellowship meal. And not just of a fellowship where we are united as certain individuals around some frivolous things. Can you see that we are all united by the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And these are the things we all have in common with one another. May the Lord help us as we approach His table. May He deepen our faith and our understanding of these things. Let's pray. <clears throat> our Heavenly Father, we thank You for Your Word. Thank You that You've highlighted for us these responsibilities that we have as the local church. But also thank You so much that these responsibilities are laid upon us because we have fellowship with you. And, O oh Lord, they press upon us in our hearts more deeply, us who realize and recognize the depth of the relationship that we have with you, our God. And so we pray that you may help us and give us the strength by the Holy Spirit to as a church, as this local church here in this place, to do and to exercise these responsibilities as a local church under Christ our head. And may you then continue to knit us together in one body under Christ our head. Thank you also for blessing us this evening with the Lord's Supper as a visible demonstration of the grace and the love and the fellowship that we have with you, our God, through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Stir our hearts to a greater resolve and work faith in us. Grow us, O Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us now stand and sing.